Cafe, and it is Sunday night, and it is the other Sunday night. The other Sunday night is sort of an open mic night, where we have storytellers from all over the world. Tonight, we've gone to a very specific area. We haven't just gone to Scotland, because that Scotland is a vast conglomeration of cultures. Vast! <laughs> We are going to Aberdeenshire, and it takes a little while to get there while driving. And tonight we have two not brilliant supporters of the cafe, Phil and Jackie, who have supported especially the Young Tellers on Tuesday nights. Um, for which I want to give them a huge round of applause and thank you for the support you've given us. Uh, and uh, a, a woman I've shared far too many fields with over the years, too many to count, <laughs> Pauline Cordner. So please, ladies and gentlemen, could you put your hands together for Bill? Jackie and Pauline, and I'm going to hand over to Phil McVeigh for. All right. It, she, she's now in charge. I shall step back and pass over to Phil. Phil, over to you. Thank you. Fit like, foo are you doing? Twa are the most likely greetings you would get in the northeast of Scotland. For Doric is spoken. Doric is the dialect of the Scots language. For your roundabout for we bide. Jackie, she bides up in Royal D side. I'm on the coast at Stony, and Pauline is a tunzer for Everdeen. So the three of us are going to give you a mixture of stories, ballads, and we'll be a wee bit of tame on the Doric, we'll be a wee bit of heavy on the Doric. A nice mix for you. And so can everyone that's not speaking mute, please? Because I'm having enough trouble understanding. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> right, I'm back. Hey, right, so I'm going to start. I bide at Stonehaven. The locals just call it Stony. And if you're going back in time, it's called Stonehive on the old fashioned maps. But out in the North Sea, there is a rock. And on that rock, there is a fabulous lighthouse. And by that lighthouse, there is Peter, the lighthouse keeper. And there he is, sitting on his little wee three-legged stool. And you've all got him in your head, haven't you? The turnips at the top of his wellies. Great big, thick, thick trousers and a jumper that goes up to his neck. A donkey jacket. A beard and grey hair and a pipe sticking out of his mouth, and he's whittling away at a bit of wood, turning it into a fabulous toy for a wee kid. Well, you're wrong. Peter's a young loon. He's perfect for this time and age. He's so antisocial, he doesn't like folks, so he loves being out on that rock. And he's and he's long johns doing his press-ups, and he's got a six-pack to die for, and any young woman would be honoured to be gone out with him, but he does not want to be married. He likes that rock and he likes being on his own and it's idyllic and he loves it. But all idyllic places, I was his a fault. And there is this pesky wee seal that just torments a living daylights to our Peter. If he catches some fish and he's gotten them, that seal will come and tip over the bucket of guts and fit it across these nearly washed steam steps. It loves trying to haul his washing off the washing line, in particular his favourite shirt. And if he can get in that hoose or, and steal some food, it'll do it. So, elky day, without fail, Peter partakes in yard brush Olympics. He chases that seal with his yard brush. He can pole vault from rock to rock as he chases it. He can swing it and throw it like a hammer, and he can turn it into a javelin. And to this day, he's never caught that seal. Now, I'm not just half sure if he hasn't tried that hard, but that seal 
just keeps coming back for mere tormentment and mere devilment. And this particular day, Peter's standing at the edge of the rock, watching the dusk come in and it beginning to get sunset. And he thinks, I better get up the stairs and put light my light to my lighthouse. And out in the sea, he sees that cheeky wee seal laughing at him. And it was just enough to distract him and he slipped and he fell in the water. Smack went his head and he was out. That was it. Oh, in good black. And he just thought, oh, well, I've had a good life. But that seal saw him. And that seal swam to him and got him by the scruff of the neck and pulled him inland and to the rocks, but could not get them on shore. So she went on shore herself and she turned into the most beautiful woman with long black hair. All of skins and twinkling, twinkling eyes as that seal had been tormenting Peter for months. She grabs him under the ox stars and she hauls him up and gets him up into the lighthouse. Gets him into the cot by the bed and gings up the stairs and lights the light. Because she's been spying on her Peter for a long time. So for three days and three nights she tends his wounds, bandages heeds, Gets him all sorted, feeds him some broth as he comes in and out of consciousness. And on that final day as he wakes up, he hears the door slam shut of the lighthouse. And he gets to the window and he looks out and he sees his favourite shark blowing back in the wind along the path. And then he sees that pesky wee seal diving into the water. And he goes, I'll get that one day. But he notices it's getting dusk and he has to go up to check the light. And he goes, oh, I've been out for a long time and I fell in the sea and I've got no idea how I got where I was. And, and he can't by the oil that that lighthouse had been on for three days and three nights. And he comes down. And he gings and retrieves his favourite shirt and he puts it on and he goes, smells differently. And the next morning he gets out and he does what he has to do. And the seal does not appear. Or the next day, or the next day, or the next week, or the next month. And Peter's getting doing and doing in the dumps. And Peter has never, ever been doing in the dumps at his lighthouse. And he's standing at the side of the water looking out. And he can see the seal. It never, ever comes in by. And they both look at each other. And he gives her a wee nod. As if to say... We've got decisions to make here. And he goes back in. Up the stairs to light the light. And he looks down. And as he looks down, he sees the seal come out of the water. Turning in to the beautiful woman with the long black hair. And the olive skin and the twinkle in her eyes. And he comes down the stairs. And he gets to the kitchen door and he leans against the door frame. And he just goes... <coughs> And there she is, standing at the stove, stirring the soup. And she turns round, wearing his favourite shirt, of course, and goes, I'm Fiona. He goes, I'm Peter. And that is how Peter got himself a wife. And it was never alone on the lighthouse ever again. So there is a wee introduction of a sulky story. For the sea. We're now going to hear a bit of fun. We're just going to go with the setup as we are, Jackie. We're near no spotlighting. And um, Jackie and I are going to have a bit of fun and tell you a joint story. And this is Silly Jack. We need props for this one. <sighs> this is our version of Silly Jack. Silly Jack is a traveller story. Um, Stanley Robertson, and this is our version, and, oh, of course, I get, I, it, being the boss of the show, I get to start again. Oh, Jackie, our Jack, the court jester, just flew in after this happened. Well, you can, it was the one sewer-faced princess. You see, that week when our Jack was working for Al Henderson, Mokinuti's buyer, Fa would come oh. along. 
Oh, I minded that week. Fit a week that was. Your son, Fair excelled himself as being gaped on Elky Day Gone. Hang on a minute, eh? That's my loon you are speaking about. I'll never hear any of this gaped. Uh, didn't you get all precious about you alone? Just how many times have I heard you say, Ah, oh, Jack Maloon, will you need use the brains that you were born with? I mind it started with some cellar, didn't it? Aye, aye, it did. You see, Henderson gave him a thrupney bet the first day because he did sick a bra job a mucking out to buy her. Well, it wasn't Jack's fault that he got ah bamboozled. Batteries on low, Doug. Ah, bamboozled when he could do the burning and see that bonny, sparkly steen in the water. He just wanted to bring something bonny home to me, his mother. And I can I f- tell him that he should have teen it him in his pooch, because he didn't thought a bit of money, didn't he? But I never thought that the loon would be stupid enough to pour the milk into his bricks. Oh, fit a sotter. They were stinking. It was good advice to put the juggy on his head, though. But I was there the next night when he come home. He didn't get milk that night, he got butter. He was dreepit. It was running our way. The only good thing that came out of that butter was his hair shone for a weeks and weeks afterwards. But yon lugs of his were just full of butter. He was deep for hours. What a Karen. It was a bitty. But then you give him some advice. Do you mind? You tell them that he should have seen a butter hair between two dock and leaves. Do you mind telling them on? Okay, that's good advice for butter. How was I supposed to ken that old man Henderson would ging and give him a kitten? Far pays a loon wee a kitten, for goodness sake. But I dev laugh. I have dev laugh at him trying to wrap that kitten up in doking leaves. Well, you man laugh. But it was me that had sort to sort the loon out. I mean, it was covered in scrats. Oh, it was sair. It looked like he'd been trailed through a barbed wire fence backwise. And he still didn't learn his lesson. Because I dealt him he should have seen a wee tow and seen a kitten him at why. So, of course, the next day, when Henderson gave him a bean, out to his pooch comes Jack with the tow and he ties it round a ham bean and he trails it him like that. Well, you can imagine. It was no time at all. I thought it was a hell handful of kelpies in the gobbled a lot. I heard them for your place, the yelping at them, just chasing that bean as he yipped it. But you have got to admit, Quine, that was gape it. Well, what's happened? In t- please tell me that on the last night, old man Henderson, for all his hard work, gave him a decent amount of cellar for his pooch. Well, you are sitting here the day in a king's palace waiting for a grand performance for my jock. Mm-hmm. Ah, because if it happened one day, well, you see, all man Henderson get him a cuddy. Oh, he would have been all right with that then. He had a bit of tow in his pooch. He would have tied it round the cuddy and teen him him. Well, I, but I had dealt him that he should have teen been him and that he's oxter. Then I tell me the guy put loon tried to carry the cuddy him under his oxters. He did. He did. And I don't know if you have ever seen somebody trying to carry a horse and eat their oxter, but it's enough, I said. And it just so happened that the king was driving by in his carriage, and when he looked through the window and seen what Jack was up to, he started to laugh. He laughed and he laughed. But of course, sitting next to him was the sewer faced quine of his. Fucky. Here, look round about you. You'll hate to stop car or that. Just look at all these men with big weapons. You need to watch what you're doing. Well, but with a card or not, but I suppose you're right on you. I better watch what I'm saying because, well, there might be some royal lugs flapping. Oh, but fit and woo is normally my disease. It's normally me that gets into trouble with that. But fit was so special about the king laughing. 
Well, it was this buckle king lachin. It was a princess, though on sewer faced bosom, a forlorn, it was a wee grin, and then she started a wee chuckle, and that forlorn she was laughing and all. <laughs> she was laughing and laughing fit to burst, and sign her and the king were just at it, and there was tears streaming down their faces. Oh, mighty fit I say. Nice and gape it after eyes, he. No, he was not. It was a mock and a word, Jack. And in the princess and the king get awa, Jack spotted that Nino the king's men were trying to carry their cuddies and neft their oxters. So he loped it on to his wee horsey and he come home and tilt me if it had happened. At long last, that loon used a brains he was born with. Aye, he did. And here we are today, most important of all, he got a job as a court jester, and we are going to want to see this performance. Now, shush, because it's a while to start. I will. Just you hang on a minty. Here we kiki over there, and you just here look at that sewer faced princess. She's nice to sewer faced after all. And we might just be back here wearing our fancy bonnets afore long. Just here look at that. Maybe. And that is our version of Silly Jack. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> I enjoyed that. I hope you all did. Right, we're going to bring Pauline into it now. Pauline, we're going to leave you to enter. <laughs> I certainly will. Thank you, ladies. I've never seen the Twilies in hats. Oh, that was brilliant. Um, well, <laughs> when I again, Polly, you'll never see it again. <laughs> well, ladies and gentlemen, and Abdi else, um, I'm going to sing you a wee song. Now, in the northeast of Scotland, we've got a huge tradition of ballads, great, long, miserable ballads that tell of death and sorrow and ghosts and, and all that. But I'm not going to do one of those ones, nay today, um, because I'm going to sing a song that um, it was actually my granda's favourite. And this is a bothy ballad or a Corin Kister. And it was one of the songs that the farming boys would sing to each other in, in the evenings as means of entertainment. And quite often uh, they would sing about real life situations um, when they were working for a good farmer, the crew they were working for, or oh, maybe the farmer's bonny daughter. And sometimes the songs were warning to the other boys, don't go and work for this farmer. And John's heard me sing this one before. Um, to tell you what's going to happen in the song, because it is quite strong, Doric, the singer has fallen in love with a girl, but her father hates his family. And every time he goes to see them, he sends the dogs after him. So he sends his best friend, McFarlane, to go and chat up the lassie for him. Unfortunately, he ends up chatting up the lassie himself. And the rest of the song is basically colourful insults. And it's just my favourite. It's called McFarlane of the Sprots of Burnie Boozy. That's the farm that McFarlane was from. And it goes a bit like this. Ah, for that I be tyrannies, tis I this vile they been. I'd rather run tall burst and back with pays and bath machine. I would rather do for the want of breath and pine for the want of love. And it's all because McFarlane married Susie. No, Susie's conquered favour and mine would never agree. And every time I crossed his gate, he would hunt his dog at me. So I sent my friend McFarlane down to see what he could do. McFarlane, all oh, this brought a Barney boozy. I do not like McFarlane, I'm safe in your estate. His lugs would cast a shadow out of a sock's fit gate. He's as soft as honey goblin and slithery as a skate. McFarlane, oh, the sprouts of Barney Boozy. 
McFarlane spark nae work for me, but plenty for himself. Here is the lassies that they scones are kebuk and their kale. Till her father cried out, Sprotty man, you should try your luck yourself. To McFarlane know oh, the sprots of our nae boozy. Though McFarlane is the grimmest chill for twenty mile a run. And they buy his photograph to flag the rotten's for the tune. Well, he kettled up his spunk at this, he's feared if she'd come down. And we mistress saw the sprouts of our neighbouzy. I don't like McFarlane, I tell you it's a fact. He's a nose for splitting hailstones and a humpy back. His legs like gutter perker at every step, his knees can knack. McFarlane, oh, the sprouts of our neighbouzy. He said that he is able both to play at count the ladle. We are lighted out a trickle cask and car the chamfer by. Another, oh, his winners is the sawducks mist with shunners, says the spice for feeding hens at Barney Boozy. An educated ostrich for the wilds of Timbuktu. He has for scratching up his neeps, so he has no them to poo. I can never heard the like of that come out on a moo. But McFarlane, no, oh, the sprouts of our neighbouzy. I don't like McFarlane, it's Arthur, but it's true. A Peter Speed was tint in Jock McFarlane's moo. He could na well be grimmer, he sups his bros we a skimmer. McFarlane, no, oh, the sprouts of our neighbouzy. Oh, a dirl, oh, the teeth it's na particularly sweet. But love's the only thing on earth that could ever guard my greet. It's like kittly chilblains in your head instead of on your feet. They were aggravated by the sector Susie. So, friends and kind philosophers, you've heard that me befell. Never look into the other man, but do your work yourself. Or I'll bet my hinmost circuit, you're a day a hunter market, like the day I sent McFarlane down to Susie. I dunna like McFarlane, I'm fairly half a joke. I dunna like McFarlane or McFarlane's folk. May Susie be a turtle, but bring her tongues and spurtle. Dun ower the heed o' jock, o' barney boozy. There you go. <laughs> oh, just grand, Pauline. Oh, thank you, gosh. thank you, thank you. <sighs> this is fun. Right, Jackie, it's up to you now. We're going to walk up to Royal D side. And amongst the royals, and Jackie's got a story of a Scottish king. Thank you, Phil. I, because I do indeed bide on Royal D side, nay that far from Balmoral. But this story that I'm going to tell you comes from a bit farer up the glen. Although I think the royals in a fair bit of Braemar as well as Balmoral. But wa back when this story was set, the tune that is now called Braemar, usually the callest place in the hell of the UK, was split into two little hamlets. On a side of the Clooney Burren, there was Castleton. And there you saw the Bra Castle o' Kendrocket. And on the other side of the Clooney Burren was Achendrine. And a side was Catholic and the other side was Protestant which is nothing to do with our story, but it's a wee bit of interest in history. Now, the story comes from the time of King Malcolm III of Scotland. And you've probably never heard of Malcolm. He was famous, though, in Scotland. He ruled for 1058, right up to 1093. That was a hell of a long time for a king to rule in those days. And he, his feather 
was Duncan. And some of you might have heard of Macbeth, because I think you folkies doing there in the south have some writer buddy called maybe William Shakespeare. And he wrote about Macbeth. And Macbeth killed Malcolm's feather. But that's nothing to do with the story either. But it's another bit of fine interest in history for up about here. Now, Malcolm III, he was married to Saint Margaret of Scotland. She, oh, Saint Margaret was a recht fine deem. I mean, she looked after the poor and she bigot hospitals and she was off a wheel liked, ah, over the country. And she's the only royal Scot that's ever been gain a sainthood. But that's nothing to do with the story either. But I have to speak about Saint Margaret for she was enough a fine deem. So maybe I better get on with the story. It was a wah back, heiny back. And it was based around about Kendrochet Castle. Now, this castle was a favourite place of King Malcolm and a lot of other Scottish kings forby, for they liked to come up there to gang hunting because it was a bra place for hunting. There was boar and bear and deer and grouse and capercaillie, all kinds of things that you could hunt for in this muckle wood. So the castle was keep it ready for the king to arrive at any time. So of course there was a constable in charge. Now he wasn't a wheel like it run about a place of ah, for he was a haired hard-hearted man that didn't give a jot for any other body. But the folk were grateful to him for a thing, because you see, Vaughan Constable had catched the muckle boar. Now the muckle boar was a gigantic, absolutely massive wild boar that had been gone about terrorising folk I mean, it had gobbled chickens, it had eaten lambs. Some folk even claimed it had gobbled a bairn. Well, the day that the constable catched on boar was a day when Abdi rejoiced. But in Divilo Achil, he didn't kill it. No, nah, no. Nah. He kept it as a pet. He did. He begged a special enclosure, recht doon at the fit of the castle ramparts, for the boar would stun there, grunting <laughs> and eating anything it could get its hands on. Well, afore long, a constable thought, this is nae is a va. I canna hae this boar eating me out a hoose and hem. So he get ruined to ah the peer folk run about Castleton and Achendrine, and he said, you'll have to give me something to feed this boar. You can imagine, foo hard that was in the folk. Some of them only had a or two kai. They didn't have muckle to give the big boar to eat. And a day, the widow MacLeod was telt that it was her turn coming up. She would have to give the constable her a coo. She only had the een, and she would have to gee it up to feed a boar. Well, a peer woman was beside her shell, for she'd scrimped and saved for years to buy the on coo, and she didn't have a man to help her. He had been killed in a fight a long time ago. So at night, when she was stunning there, doing the dishes, she was near greeting. And she said to herself, oh, Mechty, what am I going to do? If he talks my coo, I'll have nothing to mock cheese or butter we. I'll have nothing to sell to tuck in some feed for me and my loon. Oh, this is awful. I wish my man was still here. For he was a bra hunter. He would have shot a devil of a thing, and that would have been the end Well, fit the widow didn't can was that her loon was lugging in. He heard often that his mother had said. And that night, lying in his bed, he come up with a plan. 
the next day, he got up to the woody and he got himself a copper keely with his bow and arrow. Because he was a nabod shot and all, his feather had taught him food to sheet. So he teen this copper keely and he hid it down in the back of the hoose. So he made three brand new arras, ah, fine barbed and bonny feathers, and he tied them in that special way that his feather taught him. And he hid them in all. And he said nothing to his mother, for he didn't want her to worry. And that night, he waited until she was soon asleep. And he creeped out of the house and ruined the back. And he picked up the copper keely and his bow and arras and he headed down to the Clooney. And when he got there, he stood in the banks of the Clooney on the Aachen dry inside and he looked across the burren, recht o'er to the pit for the muckle boar bed. But of course, there was soldiers on guard. So he had to be guy cane kind. He had to watch that nobody would see him. But he waited and waited until he seen his soldiers weren't a watching. And he stood up and he whirled on Copper Kelly Rooney's head and he flung it right across the burren and it landed into the pit for a muckle board bed. So he hunkered down and waited until he heard <laughs> the boar was out of its den, coming o'er to gobble the on copper Kelly. <laughs> well, as soon as Sandy saw the boar, he got up, he teen aim, and he let flee with that arrow. And it gets straight and true, right across the Clooney, right into the heart of that muckle beast. And it drop it deed on a spot. Well, Sandy skedaddled out of there, quick as quick could be, and awa him. You can just imagine, in next morning, fit to carry on up at the castle, the constable was furious. He just was beside himself. And he sent his soldiers out to hunt for the buddy that shot the muckle boar. For he'd noticed that the arrow was put together in a special kind of way. He said, go and find the buddy that tied their feathers like thorn. It didn't talk his soldiers long to come upon Sandy McLeod. And they dragged him back to Kendrochet and the teen him up in front of the constable. And when the constable seen this young loon, he said, that's no why you shot a muckle boar. I did so, said young Sandy, and I would do it again. What are you saying, said the constable. I would, I would sheet it again, for it's no fair you getting all the peer folk to feed on muckle boar. You can, it's no east folk can hardly live. Well, a constable was not moved one little bit, and he announced that Sandy would be hung the next morning. His mother was beside herself. The peer women, she thought, oh, this is all my fault. Oh, me, fit can I do? There's no point in trying to plead with the constable. He when I listen to anything I have to say. But she can't that there was word a king was coming to the castle the next day, so she thought she might ging and intercept him and see if he would maybe listen to her pleas for mercy. So she followed to Clooney Burren, right up, up, up to the Cairnwell Pass, and she sat there all night waiting for the king's party to arrive the next day. She was fair frozen, she was, but at last she seen the king and ah his entourage coming up towards the pass. And when she seen him, she flung herself down in front of him and said, Your Majesty, Your Majesty, please help my, my son. He's just a loon. You have to save him. Well, the king felt a real sympathy for this peer woman, and he promised he would gang and find out if it was gone on. So he headed down to Kendrochet, and he arrived at the castle just 
is the soldiers were ducking Sandy out to the gallows to hang him. Well, the king halted proceedings and Gideon had a wee chat with the constable. And afore long, he cried on Sandy and his mother to come in. And the king says, Sandy, you've done a terrible thing. Though it wasn't your property for killing. But I'll tell you fit. If you tuck up my challenge, I'll give you your life back. Well, Sandy thought, fit have I got to lose? And he says, nay, bother your majesty, I will definitely tuck up your challenge. But Finaloon, seen fit the challenge was, he said, no, nah, no, nah, no, nah, I've changed my mind, your highness. No, 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 just hang me. I'm nae doing it. For the king had put Sandy's mother o'er on the ledge on the Aachen drain side of the burren, and she had a lump a peat on her heed. And he'd telt Sandy, you stun in the drawbridge of the castle and sheet that peat off your mother's heed and you'll get your life back. Well, Sandy said, I'm not doing it. No, nah, no, nah, you can talk my life. But the king said, you made a promise, Loon. You canna back out new. So he had no option. So he speared for his bow and his twa arras. And he took in of the arras and he put it into the bow and he took his shotgun hands up and as he looked across at his mother, recht entered in, he drew strength for her courage in the wee smile that came out her face. And the lad stood there and he let fling with the ara. And it gets sheeting across the clooney in the other direction this time, recht into the peat and cut it off her heed. Well, the Folk cheered. Abdi was fair chuffed. The dead Teresa, they were cheering just like you. And the king patted Sandy in the back and said, Well, Dean Loon, now tell me though, but why did you spear for another Rara? Because if you had messed with the first Dean, I wouldn't have let your hair go with the second Dean. And Sandy said, Well, your majesty, if that first dean had hit my mother, the second dean would have hot you. Well, Abdi went quit. There was na a soon. You couldn't say something like that to the king. But the king, he looked at Sandy and he laughed. He said, Mechty Chio, you're guy hardy, aren't you? I'll tell you fit, hardy by nature. Hardy by name, fe nu on, you'll be called Hardy. And I can tell you that up about Bremar, there are still folk gone about called McHardy. And that's my story. Thank you, thank you, Jackie. Oh, fabulous, fabulous. Um, right, you've heard from us all. Now, this is a bit for you have to take part in it. I hope you are listening well, because we've got a little, little wee quiz for you. Now, most of you are of the generation that you will mind of Call My Bluff. So we are going to have a Doric version of Call My Bluff. And each of us are going to take one word, and we're going to give you three definitions of that one word. Jackie's going to type something up in the chat for you to get just remind you of what they are and then we're going to quiz you if you think the meanings are. So it'll be myself, it'll be Jackie and then it'll be Pauline. My word is stop or stop it. Now you are carrying a fence. You've got a fence and at the corner you've got a strainer post. An elky good fence maker at a strainer post has a little wee angle post at either side to make sure it doesn't get pulled into the park. That wee strap at each side is called the stop. So that's definition one. Definition two is going back in time. 
to find your first flasks that come out for your fancy piece and your fly cup in the morning and in the afternoon and your flask had a cork stop on the top of it. So the top of the old fashioned a retro, you would know it's a retro flask now, they were normally tartan, they were green and they were red and they were blue. And if they were pink, that was a really old that had just faded. <laughs> <Fair read. laughs> now the cork on the top was the stop. So there's two versions. The third version is when you've been at home and you've gobbled up your third plateful of apple pie, cream and ice cream. And you just literally kind of get another move fit in and you stop it to the gunnels. So that's the three definitions of stop. So do you want to come off mute anybody and have a guess or who wants to have a guess of what were the right definition of that was? Knee takers? Come on. I'll, 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 go, for, I'll go for three. All right, John's going for three. Well, I'll, I'll go for three because where I am now, that little wee uh, support is called a godfather. <laughs> and so I don't want the godfather to be a staff. So I think I'll have three. Okay. I think I'll go for two. You're going for two, the, the cork and the flask, okay? Yes. Mike? Yeah, I'm going for two as well. He's going for two. And Mike? Well, just so they're all covered, I'll go for one, although I was thinking two. <laughs> <laughs> well, two of you are right, two and three of you are wrong. <laughs> it is ain't one, then. <laughs> number three, it's stop it, fool. It's stop is fool. So stop it to the gunnel, stop it, fool. So well done, John and Janet, wasn't it? Yes, it got that one. Well done. Well, well now done. I need a flask. Yeah. Let's see if you get stopped. You were wrong, Maloon. Right, stick yourselves back on mute now and we'll hear Jackie's free. Thank you very much. Well, my word is yoki. Okay, yoki. So imagine that you have this fine workhorse, a Clydesdale. We are bonny, shiny coat and great muckle, hairy feet and alert lugs. And it's all decked up in a bonny harness with sparkly kind of brasses and a reed feather sticking up between the lugs. If thon beast, if you were to yoke thon beast and work it for the hell day, Without the horse tiring, you would call it a yokey horse, okay? A horse that was fit for a day's yoking. So yokey means a horse that is of fine stature. Okay, that's my first definition. Second definition. Well, actually all that is a hell pile of horse sh rubbish. Yoke has nothing to do with yokes or we cuddies. No, no, no. It is actually potentially awful embarrassing, depending on where you are. Mm -hmm. And for a boot, you're yoke. You see, if you're sitting at a table like me and nobody can see below your waist and you've got yoke cleats, then Nobody's going to notice if you give them a good claw. But if you were going to start yoking your heed, then folk might start to win our fit beasties are running through your hair. And if your doubt was yoke, oh, no matter so much you hoached. You're just mightn't be able to stop yourself a clan in that unmentionable place. So it can be real embarrassing if you're yoke. Because yoke means itchy. Okay. 
Now, if you believe that, you've been listening to our money stories about we folk, and you'll believe anything. Because yoke actually comes from the same root as the word yokel. And you are ken for a yokel is. So the perfect description of somebody that is yoke would be probably a young loon, although in these days of uh, equality, it might be a young quine, far is apprentice, a, an apprentice. And some of his workmates might say to him, Ging a wa doon to the storeman and ask for a long stan or a bubble, a spare bubble for a spirit level or a left-handed screwdriver. And the loon would ging running a wah to try and find any of those things, which of course you are can do not exist. So a young green apprentice is yoki. And that are the definitions. Is it one, a working horse or fine stature? Two, tartan paint. Oh, I, you could gang for tartan paint. Of course. That's a good hint. <laughs> Two, is it itchy? Or three, is it a yoke? But do you think? I'll ah, vote for itchy. I think you itchy. Like Itchy, okay. Mm. John, what do you think? I'd love it to be itchy, but I think it's the horse. Oh, you think it's the horse? Okay. But you, Mike? The acting was so good, I've got to go for itchy. <laughs> <laughs> well, Janet. I have, a, yeah, I, I have a friend who judged uh, heavy horses. And I never, ever heard him use that word, ever, ever, ever. I'd like it to be itchy, but I'm going for a yokel. Yeah, I think so. Yeah. Okay. I, I also am going for one. You're going for the horse. Yes. Okay. No John, around. Horse in a rune. <laughs> oh. John. <laughs> the, 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 uh, I mean, I, I, I so want it to be itchy. But uh, the, in, in fact, just for the sake, because I want it to be itchy. I, th I actually, I think it's the horse, but I'm going for itchy. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah, it is actually itchy. Ah. If you're yoki, you are itchy. And if you've got yoki queets at your uncle's, a yoke heed, and I guess that you guessed that a yoke doup was. I better need to demonstrate a yoke doup. That would be unprofessional. <laughs> your babuki or your dog. <laughs> well then, I too have got three words for you all. Now, uh, three explanations of one word, I should say. My word is Furly Gorums. I'll say that again. Furly Gorums. Now tell me this. Definition one. Furly Gorums are wicked little spirits. Or in some definitions, they could be fairy folk. And it's them that's to blame for any general mishaps, missing objects, disasters and so on. So, as the famous Northeast poet Johnny Gibb wrote in his 1864 Hernley, Hernley Lament, from the futterit scurls like a fleggit chuchet, lumping out the gurs on scrogs a forum, her plumma wa fe cloven hoddy, you'll ken he's been feared by a furly gorum. So, there you go. That's, that's my first definition. The second one. I used to gang over to my granny's house, my grandmother's house, and she had this fine, fine set of shelves that, the, that my dad had made for her. He was a giner. He made stuff with wood. And in there, well, she had quite a lot of grandchildren. And in there, every single child would buy her a little cheap ornament from the corner shop that only cost pocket money for every birthday, 
for every Mother's Day and for every Christmas. And she had this huge clutter of little ornaments. And that was what she called her collection of Thurley Gorums. So that's number two. Or is this what a Furley Gorum is? Furley Gorums are the blessings said around the outside of a new house as part of the moving in ceremony, particularly in the fishing families in the northeast of Scotland. So it might be some of the salt which was used for packing the herrings that would be sprinkled around the door frame. Um, and around uh, the window frames? Or would they take some um, tar and they would coat a couple of stones and put them on top of each other just to resemble a sort of protective mannequin? Is it that? That's your third definition. Um, Furley Gorums are blessings said when you move into a new house. Or was it number two? Furley Gorums are the, the knickknacks, the clutter that... Uh, typically grannies have in a cabinet, or are furly gorums those wicked, wicked creatures that they get the blame for everything going wrong in a Scottish household? So, what's everyone saying? I don't know much it. about the thing, but I think it's number one. You think it's number one? So we've got one for the wicked creatures. Okay, Kath, I think I saw your hand go up. I'll go for um, the knickknacks. Oh, the knickknacks! One, for two, one for the knickknacks. If it isn't the knickknacks, it ought to be. Thinking. Oh no! <laughs> oh, if it isn't, it ought to be. Is it David? Why? Uh huh. Are you going for number one, David? Right. So we've got no. two, two for the wicked no, beasts. No, no. Thanks, David. No? Uh, uh, no, let me see. David, did I get that right? Are you saying number one? Uh, awesome. Uh, right. Who, who, who was next? Was it Janet? I, I, well, I'm, I'm not going to go for, for the knickknacks because in the West Midlands, if we have knickknacks like that, um, I, Kat's probably heard this because she lives close by. We call that tranquilments. You have your tranquilments. Oh, that's yeah, lovely. You, I love I, that. I, so I don't want anything, anything to usurp that word. So I think I'll have blessings on a house. You're having blessings on a house. Excellent. Okay. Mike, I think I saw a hand going up. What do you reckon? Yeah. I think number two is tchotchkes. <laughs> And I think this is number one. The, the Furley Gorums are like the she. The she, yes. N nasty little craters. Absolutely. Okay, um, I'm on page two. Teresa, did you have your hand up? Did you have a thought? I, I, I'm really, I don't, I just haven't got a clue on any of them, but, but I'm going to go <laughs> for, uh, I'm going to go for Blessing blessings on the house and, and I think we haven't asked Mr John Rowe what do you reckon John well I don't, I don't think it's number one because I've hung around you long enough in fields with when you've had these strange creature puppets and I've never heard you call any of them uh, a furly gorum so um, no. so I, 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 I kind of like the idea of knickknacks being furly gorum so I just uh, it just um, it just fits so I'm going for number two <laughs> well those of you who said wicked spirits no I'm sorry you're not right I made that up Neither are they blessings on the house. And those of you that said knickknacks, that's your furly gorums. That's my favourite Doric word. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Janet. <laughs> okay, I still call them tranquilments. <laughs> yeah, I think, well, at least I was uh, consistent. I missed all three. <laughs> <laughs> and my ego is just the size of a house reason. now, having got all three. <laughs> <So> <laughs> No, it was the size of a house already. A size of a a size of a castle. <laughs> um, 
<laughs> well, well th oh. thank you, thank you all very, very much. Thank you for your great participation in that at the end. That just made it for us as well. I hope you enjoyed. That's our little um, program over. Um, if you want to ask us any questions, any words that were said that stumped you, um, uh, uh, please ask, and we'll try and help you out. Did we cover oxters? Both Jackie and Phil said oh, okay. oxsters, but I'm not sure yeah. if we... Oxsters, yes. under your oxsters. I, I was kind of hoping that action would do it, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Although there's a brilliant ballad that I don't know if Pauline sings, um, and the line is, he oxstered up Al Hughie's deem, which means... Al Hughie's deem. Yes, he took the young girl, the daughter of Hughie, um, who would have been a farmer who farmed a farm called Hugh Head. Okay, so he took her round the shoulders and danced with her. So he oxtered <laughs> up Al Hughie's deem. <laughs> I do oh, sing no. that one. <laughs> if I may. I found this very not only ex I found this exhilarating, but it also reminded me of the dialect of the of the Geechee people of the Gullah Gullah, off of the uh, an island off of the Carolinas and Georgia here in the United States, and I think some of the words that you use today in your stories, I've heard from the Gullah people, which is a rich mixture of African languages. Um, and 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 um, if I may say, European or Anglo-Saxon languages as well. It's a very rich mixture. It also reminds me of patois. Um, patois is different in Haiti. It's different in um, um, Africa, and it's different in Louisiana. And it's also a food. But listening to your words, some at which I was actually familiar with, reminded me of all that. So I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Thank you. That's brilliant. I read a book in the Patois once and um, it had a glossary at the back, but there were there were a few familiar words, so I can see that. May I ask you which Patois you were reading? Do you? Oh. It, it's, it's all right if you don't know. I, it's like I, I used it to do stories. Wonderful. <laughs> I used to do stories in Geechee. Well, you're not supposed to say Geechee unless you are. But I used to do stories in Gullah. We got it down so pat that no one could understand us. So we had to stop doing it. Nowadays, if I do, if I start doing it again, I'm going to get me a translator. <laughs> Who will just know the story. See? But yeah, I, I, I love words, especially words that are not commonly known outside of a a particular culture. So, uh, Vizuri Sana, which is Swahili for very well done. Thank you. You've, you've had this storyteller spellbound. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Baba, you just reminded me of Jackie did a story quite a few months ago, well, probably last year, where she used a, a mixture of, of languages in order to tell the story and i found that absolutely brilliant you should do that again jackie you three should do something together again it's been really <laughs> great thank you teresa thank you thank okay, you now you've given me a programming <laughs> challenge haven't you Teresa? <laughs> <laughs> i'm trying to catch up with tomorrow let alone... but, but believe it or not that actually you can actually get a doric dictionary which is doric to scots and Doric to English, and English to Doric. It's and that's amazing. And I once um, lent it to, I was on a writing course and I had an American tutor on the course and they had a look at it and they turned around and they were Jewish. And they said an awful lot of the Doric words are um, Yiddish. And they, 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 they recognized it from, um, from, from that. So it, it really it is it's 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 just words that move about um, Europe. It's 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 amazing. David, you wanted to say something. Oh, uh, I don't know. Uh, no.
You're breaking up a bit for me, David, but you didn't know what we were saying a lot of the time. Is that it? No, no. Okay, you then didn't know. Now, uh, it's the last word I can't get, David. Just type. You didn't, so you didn't understand. No. No. That's not, that. um, That's not what you're saying. Okay. We, we, we'll, we'll have to we'll have to do a Doric story, and we'll have to get one of us to tell it in Doric, a line at a time, and someone and and the other one to do a translation into English. That would be a bit of fun, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> Oh yes. yes, I I do know Ruth. That's right, David. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That would be good. I could do that. She, oh yeah, she she can do the Doric. She comes from up near where I live. Yeah, mm -hmm. so she can definitely do the Doric. Oh. Well, if, if if John invites us on again, we'll promise we'll do a story, a line about in English, and uh, uh, somebody will tra somebody will do it in Doric, and somebody will translate it into English for you. Or, or maybe <laughs> as maybe as they do in used to do in the cafe in the clock cafe in Marrakesh, they uh, they they tell the story in Arabic uh, or in um, in uh, uh, Berber. And then someone would just give a, a bare bones in English oh, yeah. at the end yeah. of the story. And that, that kind of means you get the flow, but then you get the under or they do it, they do the bare bones before because and then you're just listening to the flow with uh that, that's either, a good either, idea. Either way. Well, it's been a fantastic night. Thank you, three. I knew it was gonna be, I mean, it just could, you know. Pauline, <laughs> Phil, and Jackie, could it be anything else but magnificent? <laughs> of course. Thank you all. Uh, another round of applause before I go on to the parish notices. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> thank you, everyone. <laughs> thank you, thank you. Yeah, we should, you know, if this was a folk club, there'd be a raffle, but, you know, <laughs> we, there's no... There's, 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 <laughs> There's social distancing right now, so raffles are out the window. Uh, but what we've got coming up tomorrow in uh, Connecting the World by Story, we've got part two of uh, Bringing Stories Alive Through History. I've still got to arrange loads of people, but there is one person who's sitting in some magnificence in purple and gold who's coming on to, uh, to, to be with us tomorrow night. Um, I promise I won't leave you by yourself, Babasi. I'll get you some company. <laughs> and, and uh, um, so will it be six o'clock your time? Six o'clock our time. The only, Which is the only roughly one o'clock my time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. The only time we do different mm -hmm. is um, uh, Tuesdays. Mm -hmm. Right. And by the way, I'm still working with the uh, various um, home schools and alternative schools to, uh, to to encourage them to tune in and have their students um, contribute. Yeah, even even if they don't tell, it's kind of nice for them to listen to other young people. Yes. Uh, in fact, we've got three of our uh, our greatest, four of our greatest Tuesday night supporters on. We've got Phil and Jackie and David and Mike, who have consistently supported us on Tuesday night. But it is an hour earlier. Tuesday nights are an hour earlier um, at right. five o'clock UK so time. So that's 12 o'clock. The challenge here is that <clears throat> each state and then each county has either returned to in-person learning or they have a mixture so everyone's running around crazy because they don't they don't know what they're doing really so well, I, but but i'm i'm not giving up i'm still encouraging that's why i'm reaching out to the homeschoolers and the alternative schools yeah that, that would be brilliant and if we i know we've got two children coming on from Roma, from romania this this week we've got a uh georgiana uh storyteller who was on uh, on Friday is bringing some children from Romania that she's been working with. Um, we don't know how many with Gaza because it's Ramadan at the moment, so it's kind of yes. difficult for them. Um, 
And normally we have a, a, a group from Gaza, um, Punjab and uh, and UK and uh, and and then then we have our 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 eighteen year old star from Scotland, Elsa, who's uh, who's just magnificent and appears. You know, she's at that brilliant cusp, it, so she can appear with the young tellers and she can appear with the adult tellers, and she blows everyone away wherever she is. <laughs> and uh, so, um, so that's uh, and I'm just I'm just having a look. I, uh, Friday, I've still got to sort out for our child. Uh, uh, it might be Mike actually if I if I haven't. Um, that's not as a substitute, but I've that. If I can't, if I can't get on, then I will put give you a, a, a Friday mic. But uh, let me. It was great at the beginning of the year because you didn't have to flick through the diary; it just popped up, didn't it? Now, now we're now. It feels like the beginning of the year still because we haven't gone many places. But ah, so yeah, we got uh, we, uh, and world. And of course, next Sunday is World Storytelling Cafe. Uh, which is everyone is welcome to come on and tell a story then uh, and it'd be brilliant uh sean who was here earlier is uh, is from ireland and uh, northern ireland a brilliant poet uh so i'm looking forward to him uh and just um and it goes but um, but next week i'm just going to get this in while you're here next week is just packed we've got on Wednesday, we've got Ian Douglas doing his book launch of, of folk tales from the canals. Um, and uh, then uh, Friday the 30th, we've got Hannah and Ava. So Ava is Hannah Brailsford's daughter. And together they're doing puppets. Um, Saturday the 1st, we do a 10 o'clock in the morning show occasionally. So people in Australasia and... Um, that middle of night, I ain't, ain't going to expect to see you, Bubba, unless you've just had a really late night the night before. <laughs> There's a, but so Pete, some variation tellers and Australian tellers can actually get a ch chance to participate. So once a month, I do a 10 o'clock in the morning. But if you've got no, friends... I'm well, a night owl. Just send me a reminder. You might be pleasantly surprised. Yeah, well, it's great. That, I mean, that's always amazing because we have store. We have tellers from Singapore, from India, from Nepal, all, all over there. Um, and then on Sunday, we've got Sunday is an amazing night. The Sunday the second. I, I'm going to send this in well in advance. Um, Sunday the second. It, we're launching at the first at seven at uh, six o'clock rather usual time. Colin Irwin, a uh, brilliant uh, 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 singer, storyteller, poet from Northern Ireland. He's launching his CD um, on on Sunday. He's launching it about five times through the virtual world, so loads of people hear it. So uh, which he's trying to space it out. So it's loads. Anyway, so, and then that's followed. An hour later, at seven o'clock, by the first of um, of a series, a monthly series called Rock the Casbah, which are fundraisers for our storytelling festival in Marrakesh. Um, so, uh, and that's going to have uh, Liz Weir is the first featured teller for that. So that's going to be a bit special. Um, so it's exciting days at the cafe. <laughs> it's always exciting days at the cafe. <laughs> all I have to do is get organised and it can keep going. <laughs> okay. Thank you all. Good night, everyone. Thank you, Ali, for driving the bus. Ali's on silent. Continued. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Babasi. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Bye. Thank you, Bye. fellow tellers and techno wizard. And of course, we won't yeah, we'll be lost. John. We'd, we'd be lost without Ali. Right. Bye. Bye. Tutu Anana. Until the next time. Until the next time. Bye. And in your case, tomorrow night, don't forget. <laughs> <laughs> or tomorrow, or when, whatever it is, one o'clock. Well, in the it's going to be one o'clock noon. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, I'm putting it in my reminder now. Yeah. Okay. I'll send you a message. <laughs> <laughs> Would appreciate it. <laughs> no.